a saying in the book of John. It's called, truly, truly, I say to you, I say unto you. What that truly, truly, it, they're actually Hebrew, even though it's in the Greek. Actually, it's Hebrew. It's the word amen, A-M-E-N. The word truly, truly, it's transliterated that way in the English to emphasize the veracity of God in regard to the truth. Uh, that God never lies to you. God never lies to you. It's outside his character to lie to you. And so truly, truly is that concept. Now in the Hebrew, you'll recall that in the Hebrew, uh, that's a, amen is an Old Testament concept, and it's usually placed at the end of a doxology, some important doctrine called a doxology. At the end of it, they would say amen, meaning what you just said, I agree with. Uh, let, it, let it be so. That's what the word amen means. You hear people say amen a lot in churches. I don't know if they know what that means or not, but they do say it, and probably in the old day they knew it. But when you have a double amen, like we do in the Gospel of John, when you have a double amen, then the first amen goes, is connected like this with God. Both amens are connected. There's a, there's a two-part full meaning to the word amen. On the first part is from God. It says, on God's part, uh, it, shall be, it shall be so. Whatever he's going to tell you, whatever he tells you, 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 can, you can take this to the bank, as they say. It shall be so. What I tell you, it will happen. It shall be so. When the, when the congregation responds, because they, they respond amen, the second amen, because... They, are, they have heard what, the Father, what God has said to them, and they understand it, and they believe it, and it is what they believe is ready to be applied to their life, so they say, Amen, so let it be so. Let it be so. Now, what Jesus did is he introduced this new teaching technique because what he does is he puts it on the front side of a messianic doctrine. He puts it on the front side of a doxology. He puts it on the front side. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and therefore your ears ought to perk up, because he's going to give you a messianic doctrine, some doctrine that's unique to him to identify him as Christ. Now, so far, uh, and half the book of John has truly, truly, I say unto you in it, Half the book. Uh, 25 times this is introduced to us in some unique doctrine about Christ. Jesus is the Christ, is the idea. We have studied this in chapter 1. We have studied this in chapter 3. We have studied this in chapter 5. And now we're in chapter 6. Chapter 6 in John is the longest chapter in the book of John. It's 71 verses. In this chapter, he uses the word, truly, truly, I say unto you, four times. Four times. And he uses it in sequences. And so on the top of your paper, and we're, we, we have looked at one, two, and now we're at three. This morning we're looking at number three. So... What I did is I laid out these at the top of your paper. We are looking at the third of, of the four truly trulys. The first one, the first uh, truly truly, is found in John 6, 22 through 29, the context, where Jesus talks about the miracle bread, uh, where uh, this, this truly truly comes out of a group of people who have been uh, attending the feeding of 5,000 that Tony talked about today out of the book of Mark. John, verses 1 through 15, John 6, 1 through 15, talks about the feeding of the, of the uh, 5,000, or as we really know, pr probably 10 to 12, 15,000. Now, he, out of that, Jesus talks to that crowd of people that were there, it, we call it the seeking crowd, 
uh, Jesus left the feeding, went across uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee, it did some other ministry. It's on the Sea of Galilee that he walks on water. That's recorded in John 6. And then he comes back to the other side. That group of people have been following him. It's called the seeking crowd. And they're seeking Christ. And so we talked in the first truly, truly is in verses 26 and 27, which we've already studied. Then we looked at the second truly, truly, which came from last week, came verses 30 through 40. It's called the miracle bread out of heaven. They said to Jesus, are you talking about the bread? Are you connecting the bread that you fed at the 5,000 and that you've talked about up here? Are you talking about the manna? Is this like the manna? Is this like the manna? Are you talking about the manna uh, to the Exodus generation? And he says, well, you've missed a lot of information about that because you think that that bread came through Moses. It didn't. That was me. That was me. That, that bread that came out of heaven came from God. It didn't come from Moses. It didn't come from earth. It came from heaven. And that bread, that man of bread, is shadow Christology of me. It is a picture of Christ. Now he gets into that that subject, one of the interesting things is how the crowd has changed. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Today we're looking at verses 41 through 51, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, there's one in front of you. Pick it up. Look at the book, the Gospel of John, New Testament. Look at verse 41. The seeking crowd, last week we found they had changed into a signs crowd. Give us a sign. Feeding of the 5,000 wasn't enough. Walking on water isn't enough. It had been enough probably for most of us. <laughs> they want more signs, more and bigger. We want more and bigger than that. Now this crowd, this crowd has gone from seeking to demanding signs, miracle signs. You've got to prove to us well, how many times do I have to prove it? Well, we'll tell you when it's enough. All right? It would never be enough. Finally, he just has to put a cap on it and say, I'm going to give you one final sign, and this is it. You'll get no more signs from me. He talked about the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights in uh, the belly of Sheol, and then I'll be raised from the dead. This crowd has gone from seeking him to demanding signs from him, and now have become a scoffing group. Look at verse 41. Jesus, therefore, were grumbling, the, the, the Jews, therefore, were grumbling about him because he said, and this is a key to our passage, <clears throat> he said, I am the bread that comes out of heaven. He said, I am the bread that comes out of heaven. Now, they introduced the idea that this manna was probably it. But listen, he introduced a miracle when he, when he fed the 5,000 or more out of a little boy's lunch. We're not talking about five great loaves. We don't, we're talking about the loaf you might get from Olive Garden. Right? And these fish that this little boy had would, you probably, it would have fit his little hand. You know, cut the head and tail off and you should have ate the both of them because there would have been more meat. All right. I am the bread that comes out of heaven. Now pay attention to this because this is what he's going to tell them and he's, and he's going to give them truly, truly in a moment. They said to him, is not, the, and they were saying among themselves, is not this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how then does he say, I came, do I came down out of heaven? Jesus answered them, Stop grumbling among yourselves. Now, in the Greek language, you'll see in a moment, that's a present imperative with a negative may. When you have a present imperative, which is a command, when you put, the, when you put may on the front, M-E, that, that's a light negative with an imperative, says stop. Stop doing that. And that's just what he did. 
He said, stop doing this. Stop growing among yourself. He says, no man, watch this now, no man. I think maybe, did I write udesis on your paper? Yeah, udesis. Yeah, see, let me tell you what udesis means. No one. Now, I think no one's a pretty good explanation, but this means no, listen what it means, odesis means no, not one. Just in case you might, you think I might slip by. Well, you know, I'm a good old boy. I listen, I met a lot of good old boys from the South. That don't get you into heaven. No, not one. That's who days. No, not one can come to me unless. And he does something there. He uses the third, he uses a third conditional conjunction that, that eon with a negative may. Now, this is the way it's written in the Greek. In the English, your Bible either says except or unless. Because that's what that means. And it's a strong way of identifying that. He used two strong statements. He said, no one, I mean no, not one, can come to God except through Christ. He says, it cannot happen unless or except, watch this now, the Father who sent me draws him. You know what the magnet is to get to God? The magnet that God sent is his Son, Jesus Christ. You cannot come to God apart from Jesus Christ and him dying on the cross for your sins, being buried and raised the third day, you cannot get to God any other way. No, not one of us. And when you do, it's because God sent his son, who is the second member of the Godhead, who is God's magnet, to draw men to him through Christ on the cross. Boom, there it is, buddy. If you think you're going to get there any other way, if you think you're going to get there any other way, the devil has pulled the wall over your eyes, buddy. Don't you think for a, a, don't you think for a minute that you could change your lifestyle and get in? Don't you think for a minute that you could be some hot deal in a church, give money or do whatever you think would be honorable, and somehow that will get, you cannot get to the Father, John 14, 6. No man, no, not one can come to the Father except through his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the God magnet on the earth. Jesus said in John 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. That's the same word, draw. John 12, 32, it's the same word. Hell cool. It's the same Greek word. Jesus Christ is God's magnet to draw a man who is lost and in need of salvation through him for what he did on the cross. It is Christ on the cross that is God's magnet to draw men unto God for salvation. Hoo -ah. Buddy, don't you let, listen, don't you die and go to hell. You listen to this message. I'm telling you the absolute truth from the Word of God, from the mouth of Christ recorded in the Scriptures. Believe it. Believe it for your salvation. Christ died in your place, in your place, in my place, to bring you as God's drawing magnet into a salvation by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Then he says, uh, and if he's drawn to me, if you're drawn to Christ through salvation, I will raise you up. 
I will raise you up. I will resurrect you after you die. You'll have two experiences that will be unbelievable. One is salvation. Salvation. When the resurrection of Christ becomes the resurrection of your new life in Christ. And the second one will be when you die and go into the presence of God. These two experiences in your life is from the first birth to the second birth. When you go through that, that second birth experience will be lights out compared to that. Sound. Listen, when you, when you leave this earth to stand in the presence of the Lord because you're saved, not because you go to church, not because you do good things, not because you think you deserve it, you go there because of God's mercy to send His Son, and out of His love, He draws you to Himself through Christ. When one day, because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will leave this whole earth and those you love, you will stand in the presence of one who loves you more than anybody in this world could ever love you. Who in this world would ever pay the price to save your soul? That day will be the second day in your life when you will be in awe of God's mighty grace. But let me tell you, dear heart, you will not get that opportunity unless you get the good sense while your feet are on this earth to put your heart where God put Jesus' heart, and that's on the cross. There is no other way. Don't let the devil cheat you out of the next life. Listen, don't let him cheat you out of the next life. And don't hang on to half your life that's already been cheated from you because of bad, de bad decisions not to turn that deal around. Let me tell you, as long as there's breath in your body, God want, wants you to be saved. Second Peter, third chapter, verse 9, God is not willing that any man perish, but that every man comes to salvation. Well, I mean, coming to salvation means going to Christ, being drawn by God into Christ, who paid the price, who paid it all, and to Him all I owe. That will raise Him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. Isaiah 54, 13, if you've got a study Bible. It is written in the prophets. That great chapter, chapter, listen, chapter Isaiah 52, 53, 54, all messianic. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God, everyone who is heard, understood, and learned from the Father comes to me. Everybody who hears this message that God has sent a giant magnet to the earth, put him on a cross, and him on the cross is that magnet that draws men, mankind through Christ unto God. That was true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was prophetic. Christ will come. He will die on a cross. He will be raised from the dead. It was prophetic, and you got saved by that. Galatians 3.8. Abraham, that was the message. The gospel was a message that saved Abraham. Not that any man has seen God except the one who, who is from God. He has seen the Father. Here's your truly, truly. Look at this. Here it is. Here's the big messianic point. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Do you know how you get eternal life? Do you know how you get it? It's a gift. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that who would believe Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. You know what it is? Everything you get from God is a gift. You earn nothing. There's not one thing in your life that you have earned from God. Not one thing! Not one thing! can you earn from God? Not one thing. Not one thing. Because God's principle of relationship is grace, not works. Romans, the fourth chapter, will teach you that. If, if you have any doubts about that, you just read chapter 4 of Romans, and he'll take all that away from you. 
He'll take it all away from you. Truly, truly, I say to you, that which means you need to understand it, believe it. Truly, truly, I say, he who believes has eternal life. Now watch what he does. He's going to put two words together that are synonymous. And don't miss this. The word believing and the word eating. They're both non-meritorious words. Non-meritorious words. How do I get eternal life? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, believe. God has already told you what his magnet is, right? He's already told you what the magnet is. He told you earlier in this passage. When you believe Christ on the cross, God will draw you. The, listen, what draws people to salvation is Christ dying on the cross for God to love the world. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that while we were yet sinners. Listen, you can't get saved until you know you're a sinner. Christ said, I didn't come for the righteous, I came for the sinner. Jesus came, I, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. It's interesting to me that a 50-year-old man can't understand he's a sinner and a 5-year-old boy can. Now you tell me which one ought to sit on your lap in the church for a lesson. That you're saved by grace through faith that it's a gift, not of works. When you're out in camp and you're dealing with kids from the third grade, it's the most amazing thing in the world. You give them the gospel, and they go, like, I did that. I'll take that, Pastor Ron. A 40-year-old guy, he has to sit there for two or four, four years. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What will I have to give up? What will I have to do? It's forever. Sit in a nursing home at 80 years old. And you're still going, except you don't remember. <laughs> Listen, there's a good reason why in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 2, Paul says, you got to get in your head that today is the day of salvation. When God makes it a point, or for Tony, when he takes you into the principal's office. <laughs> they never, when I went to school, we didn't go to the principal's office. You know where we went, by the way? We went to the coach's office. I mean, he put the fear of God in you. I don't want to the principal any day of the week. You don't want to go to... Ours was downstairs in the dungeon, right next to the locker room room. You did not want to go down there because he had sticks to measure you with. Boy, how our system has changed. I don't know. I'm just saying that. So the principal's office, I'd love to go in there. And, and listen, let me tell you just for a minute. You know what our coach did? If two guys showed up, because the principal would send them down to the coach, you know what the coach did? He took us out to the gym, put us in the jump zone, you know, where you jump for a ball, put these great big boxing gloves on us. I don't know. They were the biggest ones. I know 14 ounces or whatever they, the big ones are. And we boxed till we cried and begged the coach to let us out. I mean, gr grown big old ball players. We hit our knees because we couldn't lift our arms anymore and begged. Well, let me tell you, we didn't show up at his office very often. Well, anyhow, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life, and he comes back to the theme, I am the bread. Verse 41, I am the bread. I am the bread that came down out of heaven. He comes back to the theme. In verse 48, I am the bread. In verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die because he gets life eternal. 
I, in verse 51, I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven if anyone eats of this bread. You see, that's the equivalent of believing, isn't it? If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. <laughs> I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. I won't deserve it the day I die. I won't deserve that gift. But it's a gift anyhow. Because it's not dependent on Ron Adama. It's dependent on the grace of God. And the magnet that drew me was Christ on the cross. If you want it, Ron Adama, come by faith and receive it. And buddy, I did it. <laughs> I did it in 1961. I didn't even believe in God. But I did believe in dying. <laughs> And I didn't want to die without Christ because I, I believed in hell. I didn't believe in heaven, but I believed in hell. I've been around enough people to know there was a hell. There has to be. I never was around enough people to convince me there was a heaven. But, buddy, I was around enough of them to convince me there was hell. I don't know what you got saved. If it was at five, you probably didn't have mine, but I was 21. I was like 21 on a banana peeling, you know what I mean? <laughs> now, I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. Look, this, doubt, this crowd began with doubt. They, they began with doubt. They, they had, the doubt was causing them to grumble. You know, your mind is going a million places right now. I know, I've sat where you are. See, mine's in the Word of God. Yours is all over the place. Right? You probably don't like my hairdo. Where do you ever get that jacket? How long is it going to speak? You know, i got to get out of here. I'd like to have some lunch. I should have ate two donuts. <laughs> I know how it is. I've sat there. I'm going to let you out of time. But their grumbling comes out of an attitude, right? Their grumbling comes out of an attitude. Their attitude, I know who he is. I live next door to his mom and dad. His dad had this little carpenter shop. He was expensive too, by the way. There was no deals. Oh, I remember, he has a large family. They must have been Baptist or Catholic. They had way too many kids. See, that's what's going through their mind, is it not? I, I added live a little bit to the story. So there, there's grumbling because there's doubt about what he's talking about. Is this true? Is this possible? I don't think so. I know. I know his old man. His old man was uh, tough to deal with. He was always a horse trader. He'd go like, yeah, you're going to have some vegetables, but look, i got to sand your table down. Listen, we also see the danger of grumbling. In verses 43 through 46, there's a danger in the grumbling against Christ. There's a grumbling. Listen, this grumbling is going to separate you from the truth. There's a danger because the truth is being spoken to you and you're letting your mind float away into never, never land. I mean never, never land too. Why, if you could ever get where you think about all the time, you'd be successful the three times over. Then you have to come back to reality and pay bills. Pray for the lottery. You could do that. Or you could get your life right with God. You'd have the lottery, Tony. Right? See how he works on cue? <laughs> and of course, then we get the doctrinal solution. The doctrinal solution to all their doubt and discomforts of their life about the message is that tr the truly, truly I say unto you. What a great, powerful lesson. So I want to conclude. I want to conclude. I want you to go through this whole paper and do this with it. 
Do not throw it away on this property. <laughs> I've told you before. I don't want to walk out of that parking lot and find my lesson on the ground. It's demoralizing. Would you take it easy on an old man? It's, it's just demoralizing. Oh, they threw my paper away. So give me a break. I will allow you to throw it in the trash can or take it home out of my sight, which I'd prefer. But if you love the Lord, <laughs> we're going to pull that ace card out now. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Now, ah, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for your grace. What a wonderful first half to be reminded of ministry. Oh, God, we just fill, fill our cup, Lord, with ministry of this church. Oh, just fill it up full, Father. We know you'll provide for everything. Send us the people, Father. Send us the people that have a heart to the Word of God, that don't want really to crunch down with all legalism, that wants the freedom of grace to find the gifts that come with it. So thankful for that, Father. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for it. I pray today, Father, the things that our heart has felt and the things you've taught us today, especially in the second hour. Listen, if, if we get this, get this right, then we're, we're all over that first hour ministry message. Jesus said, I am the bread of the life. Come and eat and live forever. If there's somebody here today, Father, that thinks this is a difficult thing to do, it is not. But it does require believing. Believing that Jesus died on that cross for our sins and there is, no other, there is no other substitute for that. He'll die it or will die for it. One of us is going to die for that sin. If we die for it, that means hell. If he dies for it, it means heaven. That's about as good a deal as you can get. And Father, I just pray nobody, nobody, nobody but nobody that has heard our voice today both by automobile that has brought them in here and have sat here and wonderful, wonderfully have sat here, Father. Or those on the internet across the world on small islands we've never heard of before send us and said, we'll listen to you. May they understand the power of this message that needs to be taken to their community. This is not a message that needs to stay within the house this is the message that needs to go to the streets and the highways and the hedges, as Jesus said. It needs to be taken outdoors and into the other arenas of life. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.